Hello and welcome. I am your host, JP uh, John Apostle from the Two Man Power Trip. Of course, joining me is the devil himself, the games master, the task master, the former WW and ECW World Tag Team Champion, one of the greatest minds and bookers ever in the history of the business, Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, how are you doing today, sir? Good. Do you know <clears throat> there's a new wrestling uh, on YouTube? It sh shows. <clears throat> things from the past and it showed my four matches with Roop in San Francisco. Yes. Is that the part of the pro wrestling library? Was that what is that what I saw it under? I don't know what I I didn't see it. Someone told me about it. Ah, pretty pretty cool though. Did you happen to see the Iron Claw by any chance with the, yes, the, the Von did. Yes, What did I you did. think? I thought it was pretty good. What did you think? I liked it. I thought it was very good. I, I know, obviously, going in, it wasn't going to be historically accurate. You know, one of the brothers, um, Chris isn't in it. Um, they kind of don't pay attention to something. Some things aren't exactly a lined-up timeline, how they happen in real life. But I thought the way they put it together and dramatized it, I thought it was great. I really enjoyed it. I did, too. I did, too. Pretty sad, of course. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, we, we yeah. know the story going in, but very, very sad. Very sad. Very sad. Did you ever work for Fritz or did you know Fritz at all? I used to go over once in a while uh, to wrestle Buzz Sawyer and Matt Moore, me and Mark. Oh, nice. Well, how did that go? Was that a uh, stiff or what? Yeah, it was always stiff. Did you enjoy working with those guys or is there a, little, a bit much? No, I enjoyed working with them. When you had dealings with Fritz, how was he, though? Because, you know, he's depicted a certain way, and obviously the movie, I don't know if it's 100% accurate, but how was he to deal with? Well, he was just there. George Scott was the booker. He was just there. You know, I just got to say hello to him and that kind of thing. When you have to, you know, be a part of that territory... Is that something you look forward to going down there, or did you not really enjoy going down there? Well, they the second time we went, they swerved us because George Scott had, had become the booker, and David Manning was the booker before him, and I had a great relationship, and Mark had a great relationship. So we got we shot the first match. We were supposed to come back. And no DQ, it was supposed to be, end up being a draw. Well, George forced us to do it, you know what I mean? Because we're coming from Florida, and it would look bad on Eddie if we refused. But it was a shitball thing to do, you know what I mean? Yep. So obviously you got along with David Manning better than you got along with George Scott. Yeah. Yeah. I worked for David in the Caribbean up too, which was great, St. Martin. Oh, I didn't realize he booked down there. Who like who else was a part of that territory? That's interesting. Well, he would just have show, uh, shows down there. Flair would always be on it. I would always be on it. Mark would be on it. And other guys from Dallas, you know, the brothers, and the ones that were left, would be honest. Man, uh, is that a popular territory or not really? No, it just ran big shows about four times a year. I really enjoyed going down. Because you went cool down spot. for three days and they paid you for three days even though you work once. When you go down there, I mean, that, that's got to be a lot of fun. It's got to be like a little mini vacation. Oh, yeah. I've been all through the Caribbean. I lived in the Bahamas for nine months. Wow. What was that like? That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was great. Great. I lived what? with a friend of mine that had a 13-room house. I had a wing to myself. 
he had a chef, he had a maid, he had a gardener. He was a big hot shot around town. Pretty cool, though. It's almost like you're on vacation, right? I mean, when you're yeah. uh, when you're working down there. Well, Monday through Thursday, <clears throat> I gambled for him, and I think it was set up because I never lost, and I don't know how to gamble. <laughs> and wow. uh, we went at a specific time, four thirty to six thirty. So I figured they were certain turn the cameras off then, you know. And we never won less than fifteen hundred and never won more than forty five hundred. But wow, I had weird. he gave me my own Lincoln, brand new Lincoln, gave me a credit card. It was great. And then no I problem. worked weekends. I go to San Antonio, Florida, uh, uh, for Savoli, so uh, in Puerto Rico. So I was working weekends too. Man, you probably never wanted to give that up. That sounds awesome. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. When you know all that stuff is going on with world class. You know, the, all the tragedies. Were you just absolutely shocked by some of the stuff? Because Gino dies. Then, you know, obviously, uh, eventually, Kerry will die later on. But uh, Mike passes away. Chris passes away. David passes away. I mean, all these tragedies. Does that shock you as, as a wrestler? Or are you just, you know, you just kind of focus, tunnel vision? No, uh, uh, it really, really hit home to everybody. You know what I mean? One family, how could that happen? Crazy. The curse of the Von Erichs. Crazy. Yep. Sure was. Now, as far as just current wrestling, just wanted to ask you real quick if you saw some of this stuff, because I just thought it was hilarious. Have you um, been on X or Twitter? Have you seen any of the stuff between Tony Khan and Jinder Mahal and Hook? Have you seen that at all or no? No. Tell me about it. So for some reason... Tony Khan mentioned that, hey, why is everybody going crazy that Hook called out Samoa Joe, even though Hook is 28 and one? He mentioned Hook is 28 and one. So he only had 29 matches in his in his career, which is crazy. That's it. Uh, he challenged Samoa Joe, the world champion. We don't know what, what Joe's going to say about that. But then he said, oh, but you people online will complain that Jinder Mahal is getting a title shot on Raw next week. You won't complain about Jinder, but you will complain about Hook. Yeah, that's strange. You know, the kid, I, I like the kid. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes Hulk says some stuff he shouldn't say. You know, he's not going to get a title shot. Why even bring it up? You know what I mean? Very strange, yes. And it's weird that with hook you know taz's son i mean he's a he's a young kid he's challenger or wants to challenge off the title but tony mentions he's 28 and one so he only had 29 matches and then he mentions jinder mahal i'm sure jinder mahal has had 29 matches in one month ne nevertheless his whole career right 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 and why is tony picking on gender right that's, that's crazy former WWE world champion jinder mahal by the way yeah and uh i thought they would really get behind them because I thought they were going to really open up India. Right. You know, with the population there, it's the most populated country in the world. It goes between them and China back and forth. So I thought they were really going to get behind them. And then also Bischoff got brought into it too, because Bischoff was saying like, oh, that's like clown show stuff. Why is Tony Khan mentioning WWE? Why is he tweeting about Jinder Mahal? So then Tony goes back at Bischoff, and then Bischoff showed a picture of himself when he was on AEW. It says groundbreaking executive. <laughs> and so Tony Khan goes, you're a has-been. He's like, well, I'm a groundbreaking has-been then. I don't know why they get into these Twitter wars. Crazy too. Like, 
Bischoff, you know, at one at one point Tony liked him, I guess doesn't like him anymore. And now they're going back and forth. But he's mentioning WB. I know Bischoff would mention stuff about Vince, like on air. But they were head to head. They were literally neck and neck. They're rivals going head to head. Not necessarily the same, right? With AEW and WWE. Not necessarily the same at all. Did you like when Eric used to do that back in the day? Challenge Vince no. and mention stuff no. like that. No. No. I didn't like it at all. Why not though? Like you just thought was, you just don't do that. Well, he wasn't going to come and wrestle him, so why do it? You know what I mean? It would have been a hell of a pay-per-view if they did it. I agree. But obviously, you know, he, he, he's not going to show up. He's not going to do it. So do you, you don't like Tony then doing that either, right? Mentioning WWE all the time? I don't like anybody mentioning the competitor. You know, I don't see the purpose of it. It just reinforces that they're doing well, you know what I mean? Forget about them. Yep. And it's just really weird that he just mentioned Jinder. I know Jinder, I guess, is fighting Rollins for the title, and that's really why he brought it up. But it was weird to kind of mention Jinder Mahal, and then all of a sudden you see all these people praising Jinder Mahal. So I think it did nothing but help uh, WB and Jinder Mahal, the fact that he's kind of dragged them a bit. Yeah, I do too. I remember a few weeks ago with Jinder and The Rock, they had their little confrontation. So Jinder's on a little bit of a hot streak right now. They got to, you know, roll with the punches here. Yeah. Yeah. And I also feel like if Jinder gets a title shot, he is a former champion. And it's only on like a Monday Night Raw. It's not on a pay-per-view. It's not this big title shot. It's just just you know, another another show where they just kind of need a title defense because it's going up against an NFL playoff game. So maybe they feel like they need a little bit of juice. But MMA and boxing does that stuff all the time, don't they? Where guys maybe don't deserve title shots, but they just get title shots because of who they are, who they were. Yeah, exactly. And Ginger was the former world champion. So. Yep. I don't see that being a bad match. He does look like a million bucks, too. I mean, he's, yeah. he's, he's pretty jacked. Yeah, he looks like a million dollars. He looks the part, if you will. You know what I mean? He just looks yeah. like he's... And it was weird. When they did go to India a few years ago, Triple H beat him. So, it's like, isn't that a mistake? Don't you not want to beat the, the guy in the country? Because then they never went back again or didn't go back really for... Actually, until this year. They didn't go back for a while. Yeah, I... I... He, Hunter's made very few mistakes, and there must have been something else in there. The reason why he did it, my assumption is they either raised the rent on them or try to do, try to milk more money out of them. Because, like so you said, they haven't been back in a long time. Yeah, just this year there was the return, it was this year. And uh, yeah. Jinder was on the show. He was in the six-man tag. But they lost in the six-man. So I, th I don't know. That's so weird, though. Wouldn't you want the hometown fans to love your guy, you know, their countrymen going over? It's so weird that they lose. Yeah. Don't hinder Jinder, though. That's that's the key, I think. Right? Don't hinder him. Yeah. No. Now, as far as the topic of, of the note for today, topic at hand, I want to talk about WCW New Japan Super Show 2, a.k.a. Super Show 92, which was also called Super Warriors in the Tokyo Dome in Japan, which is a cool name, I think, Super Warriors. Now, the interesting to note here was on January 4th, 1992, six matches and the U.S. airing ended, ended up doing the airing in March of 1992, so a few months later. It's from Tokyo, Japan. It's from the Tokyo Dome. Over 50,000 people in attendance, so it's a big show. But just to note, though, this is the first really January 4th Tokyo Dome show, which obviously is still a tradition as of today. I mean, it's still a tradition going right now. Right, right, right. And I think it was a good deal. I mean, that's the deal we made to work with them. Two years later, it morphed into Wrestle Kingdom, and we just had Wrestle Kingdom 18 that just passed. 
Brian Danielson versus Okada. Great match, a co-main event over there. But this is the, the start of that. So is there any significance that you know of to like the date of January 4th? Because is that some sort of, I don't know, because that just became a huge tradition in Japan. It's always, no matter what day of the week it is, the, the big Tokyo Dome show is on January 4th. It must be like back in the day, Thanksgiving being the big night for wrestling. Thanksgiving was our biggest night. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and so, New Year's, you know. So, what? Uh, so as far as, as the Super Show is concerned, like I said, January 4th, 1992 was the, the first of the shows here. The show was also the second under the name of the WCW New Japan Super Show. Obviously, the first WCW New Japan Super Show was in 1991, headlined by Ric Flair and Tatsumi Fujinami. Where are you at this point in 92? FMW? Yeah, in Japan, too. FMW in Japan and Smoky Mountain Wrestling as well, right, in 1992? Yeah, and ECW. Um, now, as far as the, this show is concerned, it is WCW and New Japan. They're doing the Super Show, but there is six other matches on the show that don't air for WCW, but they do air for New Japan. Big big time show. All the big stars, Sting and Muda, are in the main event against the Steiner brothers. This show will actually draw over fifty thousand spectators and have a gate of over three point seven million dollars at that time. So I mean, huge gate here. WWE New Japan doing great business together. Yeah, excellent business because we had taken care of their guys when they came over. I like what Watts was doing. So he's there at, at this time. Bill Watts is booking with the help of Dusty. Watts is there. But it's interesting that he kind of, you know, will have a good relationship here. But eventually he starts splintering that relationship. So it's it starts good, but then it, it ends up being not so good. Was that something on, on his end? Like, do you know what happened there? Like, how come it started dissolving as far as the relationship was concerned? That was his fault. You know, Bill might ask for something on the side. I don't know. But it, you don't do that to the Japanese. A deal is a deal. With Watts, too, he's going to be at you know some of these shows when they do have these big shows, he's going to be there. But it feels like Dusty is going to be a big part of the show. It's going to be his basically his return to the ring, his first match in a year. He'll uh, then won't wrestle again until 1994 with the infamous him and, and Dustin teaming up against Arn and, and the Funkster and, and uh, Bunkhouse, Buck, uh, Bunkhouse Buck, excuse me, and the Stud Stable. But here, he hadn't wrestled in a year. Do you think Dusty played a big part as far as this show was concerned, as far as like them wanting Dusty on the show? Absolutely. He was a huge star there. I mean, going all the way back to the Texas Outlaws, Dusty was a big draw there. So he loses at Royal Rumble 1991. Him and Dustin lose to Ted DiBiase and Virgil, and then obviously that's his last match for WWF. He's gone. Doesn't goes back to WWF as a booker, and he's a part of the booking committee, but doesn't wrestle here again until January of 92. Do you know if that was something where he was winding down his career, he wanted to retire? I think they wanted him to pay more attention to booking than wrestling, which I thought was a mistake. Yeah, you, he, do you think he could still go here in, in 91, 92? Yeah. Yeah. When you're looking at Dusty and Watts, what was their relationship like? For, for a while, it was very good because when Eddie wanted to get rid of Dusty, it sounds like, well, he wanted to get rid of him. It wasn't that he wanted to get rid of him. Nobody could get over, no baby face could get over if Dusty was around. 
So that's why he would go to Watts for a while. He would go to New York for a while. He would go to the Carolinas for a while. It was to get him out so we could try to get another baby face. Not over like Dusty, but enough to give him some good support. When you're looking at Dusty here, obviously Flair's gone. He's in the WWF right now, and you know, he's about to win the Royal Rumble you know, in 1992 and become WWF World Champion. He's not a part of this show, but you do have Sting. You do have the Steiners. Obviously, you have Lex Luger, Big Van Vader, a bunch of the w- – Arn Anderson, Tabisco. You will have a bunch of WCW stars, but I feel like without really knowing or having knowledge, I have a feeling that they asked for Dusty. You know what I mean? Like that they wanted that other Absolutely. big star. Absolutely, they asked for Dusty. Absolutely. Like I said, Dusty was over in Japan. Uh, he wasn't over in the way Brody and Hanson were over, maybe even Abdullah and the Funks. But he was up there. They wanted him. It's one of those things when you look at WCW at this point, they did have some stars, and obviously they, they'll draw well this show and they will be popular, but it's not WCW 92 is not you know their best business. So I feel like this trip to Japan being successful is definitely a bright spot in 92, and I know people will get on Watts for some of his bookings and things like that, but it just felt like business was not great in 92 for WCW, but it was great for New Japan Pro Wrestling. So this show almost benefits WCW more than it uh, benefits New Japan. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so as far as this show, Lex Luger will defend the WCW Championship against Masahiro Chono. One of his last matches in WCW before he leaves, like I said, Sting and Muda against the Steiner Brothers. Dusty and Dustin will be teaming together. What do you think about Dusty going to Japan, you know, being the big guy, but teaming with his son? I mean, is he really trying to get Dustin over here? I think they asked for Dustin. They they knew that Dusty's best days had gone past them. And they want him to be a hero and get all the hot tags and do all his razzmatazz. I think it was a good idea. And that's why the Japanese do good business. They think everything through. Years later, when Dustin, and we're talking about way, way later than this, when he would return to Japan, he was using Dusty Jr. at one point. So obviously that name does carry a lot of weight still, you know, 20 years later in Japan was still carrying weight. Absolutely. absolutely. Dusty was one of the biggest stars they ever had. So as far as the show is concerned, a couple of the dark matches, not really dark matches per se, but for the U.S. audience, but I will go through them. I guess you could refer to them as dark matches, but not to the Japanese audience. You have Black Cat defeating... Hiroshi Yamamoto in about 10 minutes and 30 seconds. And then Asamo Kido and Kobayashi defeated Kimura and Yoshino in 11 minutes and 55 seconds. Those are two matches that are really for the Japan audience. Would never be seen the light of day for the U.S. audience as well. Do you like that as far as them being able to? Because I know you're probably used to this from Polynesian Pro, right? You film all these matches, but... You get this one, we get that one. You know, it's almost like they they split up the matches. Or maybe U.S. We don't really want this match filmed because it, it's Japanese guys or you know, whatever. You like that? Are you are you used to that? I think they did it because the guys from Japan, even as great as they were, a lot of people in the United States didn't know who they were. Plus, they did end up condensing the show down, so they could basically cut in half, and they make the show more condensed for when they put the U.S. broadcast out as well. Right. So, I have to mention this as well. A Japanese heavy metal band, Shoya, also perform live music between matches and even perform the theme music for the Great Muda. <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard of Shoya, but they were, I guess, a big deal in Japan in 1992. 
I guess they were, and it, it, they specifically did it for Muda, and they rightfully should have. You know, Muda started with me in Florida as the White Ninja. Yep. So he had a lot of experience in the States before he went home to Japan. Probably almost as much as Baba in Anoki. And uh, he deserved it. And he, he is terrific. So as far as Muda is concerned and you're booking him early on, did you sense that he was going to become like this huge star, like the biggest star in Japanese history? Or you're like, okay, this guy has something, but we'll, we'll see how he progresses. Nobody could figure that he was going to be that big of a star. You knew he was going to be very good, but he was, he, he's one of the pillars, right? Isn't it? Uh, of the Japanese wrestlers in Japan, Anoki, Baba, Muda, and Saito, wouldn't you say? For sure, but the Three Musketeers, like that next generation, was yeah. Hashimoto, Chono, and Muda, and all three of them were insanely popular in Japan as well. And then the four pillars of all Japan, Kobayashi, Tao, uh, Misawa, and Kawada, obviously, were, were huge as well. But I know Muda might be the most popular of them all, to be honest. Uh, to be honest, I think he is. He might, might not too. have had the respect of Anoki and Baba because they, when Ricky Dozen died and they closed shop up, they split and opened up New Japan and All Japan, and they were popular for years. And they didn't mind paying. I mean, if I had to go down the guys that I think, that maybe above Dusty in Japan, for the guy jeans, it was Hanson, Brody, the Sheik, Abdullah, the Funks, and Tiger Jitsing and Dusty were on the same level. He was in the top eight. When you look at those guys, I mean, whew, creme de la creme. Staying yeah. here on this show, I know he's not known as, quote, unquote, one of the greatest guys. Since he didn't work over there. He really was WCW. He just went over there occasionally. But they were talking about how they did a poll. Jim Ross, of course, is pumping this up. They did a poll of one of the most popular wrestlers. And Muda and Sting were both very high on the list of most popular wrestlers in Japan in this in this, in this this year or whatever, in this era. Yeah, and they did that because they want to link Sting with Muda. And they did a great job. They had a great feud many years oh. earlier, too, right? In, in 89 yeah. in WCW, great feud. Yep. So as far as the show is concerned, now we're going to start the American matches here, so to speak, the ones that are actually broadcast on the American broadcast. Jushin Thunder Liger, Agawi, and No Gami defeated Hiro Saito, Super Strong Machine, and Hogana. In 15 minutes, a pretty good six-man tag here with Jushin Thunder Liger's team getting the victory. I know you are a big Jushin Thunder Liger fan. Great innovator. Huge. He was the first guy I had on the first match of Nitro with Brian Pillman. Is that all your idea? Yep. Wow, really? So that wasn't really Bishop pushing? That was, that was you? Yeah. Because I knew he had this underground swell with the smart marks, and they never got a chance to see him, so I gave it to him. Very cool, very different. Obviously, Pillman and Liger did have a history together from 1992 in WCW. I mean, they, they've wrestled a few times before as well. 
but it's one of those things where wow, this is an awesome opener for uh, for Nitro right out right out the gate here. Pillman and Liger, great idea. Thank you, but they deserved it. As far as Liger is concerned, always a fan, big fan of his. I mean, you just saw him and say, "Wow, this guy's a, a star." No matter if he's Japanese or not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Does that matter to you? Like if the guy doesn't speak English, does that matter to you at all? <laughs> That's what managers are for. People forget that Muda had Gary Hart. Yeah, for years, yeah. Yeah, for years. If the guy can't talk, you're a manager. And I think Gary was big getting Buddha over. For Gary, sure. Gary could talk, really talk. And he got great heat. When you look at Muda too, it's like, man, this guy, you know, he's got all this ability in the world, does no English, let's put him with this awesome manager, make him even scarier, more mysterious, give a little aura about him. I don't know, I kind of I think it worked to his favor for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now in AEW, they've been doing, you know, have or having a lot of talent that doesn't speak English, but they give them such bad managers or guys that don't work with them. I mean, that could also be work in reverse, right? I mean, not giving the guy the right guy, the right manager. If you don't give the guy the right manager, the guy's dead in the water. He's like he, dead in the water. Do you know the Lucha Brothers, Phoenix and Pentagon? Yeah. Great. I mean, just unbelievable. Their managers, this guy, Alex Eberhantes, he worked for um, like a, a TV news station or whatever. I forget what he worked for. One of those like QVC or something like that. He's their manager. I was like, that, it just it doesn't work. Now, the next match up, the Enforcers, Arn Anderson and Larry Zabisco defeated O'Hara and Koshinaka in 12 minutes and 30 seconds. The Enforcers, hell of a team, love Arn and Larry Zabisco. Do you love Arn and Zabisco as the enforcers?
Do you love Arn and Zabisco, the uh, the enforcer? Yeah. I love that team. Yes, I do. They kind of complement each other pretty good. Yes, they did. I talked to Arn about Zabisco, and he always has a funny joke. He always calls him the cigar store Indian. I said, what the hell does that mean? He said he just sits there on the apron. It doesn't move. He said, stop stalling, Larry. Oh, well, let's work here. He goes, so he, and then Larry would laugh, whatever, but he was saying he took all the bumps, he did all the work, and then Larry just stood there. <laughs> yeah. Gotta love Arn. He's the best. He's got the quick wit. Great, great uh, sense of humor. Yes, he does. Do you think Larry here in 92, I know he's, he was wrestling for a while, but do you think he's still like a guy you want to push and give something more to, or do you think he should be kind of winding it down? Well, he, he's a still a name, and putting him with iron should have given him more life. Pretty good tag team. Arnold yep. in, in the cruncher, if you will, uh, the living legend Larry Zabisco. Next up, Dusty and Dustin. The Rhodes are going to team up together to defeat Massa Saito and Kim Duck. 14 minutes and 30 seconds. What do you think of Dusty and Dustin teaming together? Pretty long match, too. Fabulous. Fabulous. As you saw, the people went crazy with Dusty. Do you feel like they definitely had to go over, even though it was against Saito and, and Kim Duck? Yes. yes. Kim Duck, of course, known as Tiger Ch uh, Chung Lee. He was in WWE for quite a while, had a nice little mini feud with the Hulkster. But, and obviously, Matt Saito, he's kind of like the liaison, right, with, for you guys? Yeah. He was the liaison with us. Yes, he was. So what's his relationship in this whole thing? Obviously, he is wrestler, but he is also... Executive. Does he have to agree to the finishes and stuff with you guys? Uh, I would ask him what he wanted to do, knowing full well what he wanted to do. So I would agree with him because we would get a million dollars a year from him. So you don't want to upset the apple card. You wanted to make sure. Absolutely. Pretty interesting here that Saito puts himself in this match, you know, considering you know, he's with Dusty and Dustin, probably because Dusty knows him as well, but make him feel safe. But also, you know, that's even though it's technically you would say the fifth match on the card, it is one of the most high profile matches on the card because Dusty is returning to the ring here. Yeah. And he, he wants to sacrifice himself for, to show Dusty that he'd like to have him back. Did you ever work Saito? Yeah, years ago in Georgia. Oh, wow. What would you think about him? Great. Fabulous. What really about Tiger Chun Lee? Good, but not Saito. Saito was a legitimate wrestler. I believe great. he went to the Olympics. Yes, I was going to say great Olympic background for Saito. Right, right. You know the Japanese love that. Yeah. So next up is a quote-unquote dark match just for New Japan Pro Wrestling. But, man, it's an interesting one. Tony Halme defeats Scott Norton in about nine minutes. Tony Halme, of course, people would know him as Ludwig Borga. So, obviously, this is before Norton's going to get his big push here. I mean, he still was getting a decent push, but obviously before he became a big name. What do you think about Ludwig, a.k.a. Tony, going over Scott Norton here? Well, I guess they had signed him to a full-time contract. So that's why he went over. And about a year later, obviously, Tony goes to WBF, begins Ludwig Borga. Got a bit of a push, ends up um, losing to Luger at Survivor Series in the, the elimination match, gets injured, and then is kind of gone in, in the beginning of 94. The rumor was always he might even get a WrestleMania big-time match at WrestleMania 10, and obviously that injury and release never quite happened. Were you familiar with him at all? Did you know him at all as far as Ludwig? Not at all. Interesting to note that these two have a history together. Tony Halme in a bar fight actually knocked out Scott Norton, 
was a cheap shot. Apparently, according to all the wrestlers, he hit, he hit him when he wasn't paying attention. But still, I mean, he must pack a pretty good punch to knock Norton out. Yeah, he must. But, you know, a sucker punch is a, still a sucker punch. Yeah. He was a former uh, boxing champion, so obviously he definitely knew how to punch. But maybe he didn't want to fight Norton face-to-face. I don't, I don't know the whole story, but I just know a bunch of the wrestlers were saying that he cheap shot at him and knocked him out. Yeah, I'm sure that's what happened. So as far as the next match, it's also a dark match, not shown. Just It's just for Japan. The aforementioned we mentioned before, Shinya Hashimoto, one of the most popular guys ever in the history of Japan, legendary wrestler, defeats Bill Kazmaier. Eight minutes, 30 seconds. What do you think about that? Bill Kazmaier getting a big-time match here. Well, they like oddities in Japan. And him being the world's strongest man, it certainly got Japanese wrestler over big time. Do you think Kazmaier was built for the wrestling business? Because he, he's like this huge mammoth guy, but as far as athletic ability for wrestling, I don't know. I don't know if he had the um, the stones for it, if you will. I just don't know if that matched up with his skill set. I don't know if it did either. I don't think his heart was wrestling. Did he ever seem like he enjoyed it? It seemed like he didn't really enjoy it either. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Just a paycheck for Bill Kazmaier. I mean, obviously, he he's a huge legend, didn't really need it, but he was one of the things where if you have his look, I mean, he's he's a strong man, he's a power lifter. He just looked like he would be an awesome wrestler, but just it didn't mesh well for some reason. Right. Then we have next up two of your favorites, Big Van Vader and Ellie Gante going to a double disqualification in five minutes. What do you think about that? They're keeping Ellie Gante strong. Vader's not even getting a win over him. Yeah, that surprised me. Uh, you know, Baba for years was the number one guy. So I kind of think. They thought they could get something out of them. This would really be one of his last matches in WCW. He does have a, a bunch more, but they're basically all against Vader for the most part. He does have a, a six-man tag against Vader, Cactus Jack, and Terrence Taylor with him, Ron Simmons, and Van Hammer teaming up together. They actually take the loss in that one. But he has a ton of house show matches against Vader, and they're all double countouts, double DQs. There's no straight finish. How come uh, El Gigante can't take the loss to Vader? What, like, what's what's up with that booking? He was under a personal contract with Ted Turner. So... You gotta go, keep him strong? You gotta go the least resistance. You know, you don't want the head of the company for him to think you doubt his intuitiveness to see who could draw money, even though we proved that he couldn't. He beats Cactus Jack a few times as well on, on a few house shows and more Canterbury. So it's just interesting that uh, they did book him pretty well, even though he wasn't really getting over, like you said. Yeah. And you know yeah. the the Japanese love their freak shows. They they love guys like Giant Gazelle. Yeah. That's what I was saying because Baba had been the Giant there for years. Yep. And one year later, Giant Gonzalez is born, and he heads over to the WWF. WWF must have been watching this show. They must have enjoyed the show because they're cherry picking Ludwig Borger. They're taking Giant Gonzalez. They uh, they must like what they're seeing from some of these guys uh, on this show. For some reason, they must have. They must have seen him as an oddity that they could draw some money with. Next up, another dark match for the Japanese audience. It's a good one. Antonio Inoki defeats Hiroshi Hase in 10 minutes. So, legendary Inoki defeating another legend, Hiroshi Hase. Yeah. Well, you knew he was going. It's the Tokyo no way Inoki's going to lose a big match like that, right? right. Even right. in 92, he's not losing it. No. 
as far as the next match is concerned, Lex Luger defeats Masahiro Chono to retain his WCW Heavyweight Championship. The match goes about 15 minutes. Of course, Luger gets the win here. Do you like uh, Chono taking the loss, or do you think that's good? Because you know, eventually, if Chono will become NWA World Champion, as, as far as Watts is booking a little bit down the road, but do you like? Chono taking a loss here. Do you think that's a good showing from them? Like, hey, one of your top guys is going to lose to one of our top guys. Yeah, I think that's what it was about. Is it a little bit of tit for tat when you have to book with these guys? Like, oh, well, we'll you'll take this one, we take that one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What did you think of Chono? Well, I thought he was excellent. He had and a different be- look, too. Yeah, and he becomes NWA champion in 92 in, in, in an awesome match against Rick Rude. So it's just uh, amazing to kind of see his maturation process and really kind of see him go through the years and get that awesome, like, futuristic mafia look to him and everything else. And Very, very cool guy. He just looks like a cool gimmick. He did, And he was an awesome wrestler, but just he had that it factor to him. He sure did. He sure did. Now, Luger would be gone a few months later and head along to the World Bodybuilding Federation. <laughs> Do you like Luger stepping away from wrestling and going to the World Bodybuilding Federation? Well, he couldn't wrestle because of his contract. He got out of his contract, but he couldn't wrestle. He could do the World Bodybuilding Federation, but he couldn't wrestle for them. A little bit of a mistake on his part, you think? A little bit of stumble? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe the Lex Express. When he got to the main event, WrestleMania, traveling all those miles, and he didn't get over it, it really hurt him. When you look at that, too, it's one of those things where did taking that time off as far as the WBF is concerned and not going in the ring, do you think that kind of hurt his like just momentum? It's almost like they just shot him back in and thought, okay, narcissist, and then we're going to turn him USA and then give him this big push. But he kind of was off for a year. He just he didn't seem like his old self to me. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. Part of that is booking too, but it just to me didn't seem like his his old self. I, I have to agree with you. Being out of the room that long, that hurt you, him. Now, as far as Luger himself. You always booked him a lot better than WWF, to be honest. I mean, you you had the um, – I don't know how, how to say it, but you just had the, the right stuff as far as booking him. I booked him to give him personality, which he didn't have before. And once he got that personality where he was half good, half bad, he took off. It's funny to think like, oh, Vince is a genius. And then all of a sudden you're booking him way better than Vince ever did. So it's just so, and he got over. He's one of the most popular guys. He was as popular as Sting at one point. Yes, he was. So the I next, never had a problem with him. The next match up is a great 18 and IWGP championship match where they're going to unify those championships into just the IWGP world champion. It's Ricky Choshu defeating Tatsumi Fujinami in 12 minutes to win those titles and bring them together. Dark match, not a part of the show. Did you ever work Choshu? Are you familiar with Ricky Choshu? Yes, I'm familiar with Ricky. I never work with him, but I'm familiar with him. Excellent legend hand, and obviously Tatsumi Fujinami, you're very familiar with. Huge legend as well. Choshu was the G18 champion coming in. Tatsumi Fujinami was the IWGP world champion coming in. And of course, the year before, Tatsumi Fujinami and Flyer were wrestling for the NWA world championship. So pretty big um, co-main event here, just for the Japanese audience. Right, right. It was a good card, I believe. Leading into the main event, the final match, which of course was part of the U.S. broadcast as well, Sting and the Great Muda team up, and they defeat the Steiner brothers, Rick and Scott, in 11 minutes in an awesome match. Anybody that hasn't seen it, go out of your way to see this one. This is awesome. Everything you'd expect, athleticism, 
stiffness, uh, strong style, them just doing kind of innovative moves. It's just everything you expect. Great crowd. Sting and Muda go over. It's interesting the like final part, Sting ends up pinning Scott Steiner. Rick almost has Muda for the pin. So it was a way to kind of keep the Steiner brothers strong while get, getting Sting and Muda the victory. Right, right. And we had to send Muda home as the victor. Want those Japanese fans happy. Yep. Does it hurt the Steiner brothers at all, taking that loss? No, no, not at all. What do you think about staying in Muda, the brothers in paint here as a tag team? Yeah, I thought they were great. I thought they were great. So as far as just overall, I know it's hard to say because you weren't necessarily there, but just going back and looking at it, do you think this is a good show, a successful show? Just because it did have a couple really good matches on the show, but overall, do you like kind of the show and, and the relationship between these two? The relationship was raised because of what we did. It got over, and I give it a two thumbs up. So as far as this show is concerned, there would be one more WWE New Japan Super Show the next year, and that's kind of the last one. And then eventually WWE New Japan would have such a good relationship. They'd be trading talent back and forth for many years. Thanks to uh, yourself, Eric Bischoff, and even Sonny Ono uh, playing a part in that, right? Right. Sonny played a very intricate part in it. So not only this, this show kind of lead WCW and New Japan eventually into the right direction. I mean, this is just one of their major super shows that they have, one of three, and then eventually they would have more shows together and just more synergy, but it's also the first ever January 4th show. So this show does have a bunch of historical significance to it as well. Right. Right. You need to check out uh, Wrestle Kingdom from this year, Danielson versus Okada. You would love that match. Oh, I love Danielson. Great match. I just love the way that those two work because it's it's not your necessarily like new age. Let's kick out of every every finish and do this and that. It's nothing like that. It's very hard hitting, stiff. They're working submissions. There's psychology selling. It's a really really good match. Yeah, he's very good. He's one of the top guys in the game. Definitely, for sure. So let's wrap this bad boy up and hit the plugs. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Check out the website tmptempire.com. Kevin, what do you got going on? Well, uh, the book is selling very well. You know, uh, old school, and it's doing very well all of a sudden. So if you haven't read it, do yourself a favor and buy it, buy it, read it. And I got a new doll out, so if you see it, if you like it, pick it up. Oh, yeah, that's right. The new figure. Where is that at? Uh, Heels and Faces? Is uh, that the. Yeah, Heels and Faces. And of course, L.A. Taylor's uh, Old School, which is available on Amazon, right? Yep. Yep. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. See you right back here next time. Have a good one, folks.